Welcome to the Fifth Estate. It's great to see you all here this evening. My name is Sally Warhaft and uh, it's a pleasure to be hosting this discussion this evening on the Gonski Review of Funding for Schooling. And uh, I know I'm fairly Gonskied. I've um, read the report um, and uh, I'm very much looking forward to this conversation with our guests. And we have Joining us, uh, Leslie Lamb. Leslie is the principal of Glen Ira College in Caulfield. She's been there since 2007, and she was previously the principal of Gilmore Girls College in Footscray. And uh, before that, Leslie was an English teacher. David Zinger is a senior lecturer in education at Monash University and also a former principal at the King David School and uh, has also been a teacher in numerous state secondary schools. And Paul Sheehan, who is a former headmaster of Melbourne Grammar School. He retired from that post uh, in 2009 after I think about 14 years. and. Um, He's also, of course, a former test cricketer in the spirit of a rounded education. <laughs> uh, I welcome them all and, uh, and, and thank you for, for joining us this evening. The Gonski Review was established to develop a funding system for Australian schooling which is fair, transparent and financially sustainable and effective. Uh, and yet, one of the uh, earliest findings in it states that Australia lacks a logical, consistent and publicly transparent approach to funding schooling. I want to start by asking each of you just for your broad impressions of the report before we get into some of the details. Leslie, would you like to start it up? Mm, certainly. I was quite cheered on my initial reading of the Gonski report because I felt that it was stating things that were uh, clear and obvious, I suppose. It established some excellent evidence for the importance of a, um, a wonderful education, an excellent education, in that capacity to empower and to provide equitable results for students, I suppose. But then when you looked at the detail and the uh, I guess that it seemed, began to seem like motherhood statements to me. It became that the detail was that the, the additional money that was for government schools was only a small portion uh, and we were unlikely to get it given what Peter Garrett said about maintaining the budget surplus. So my overall uh, feeling at the end of that was of disappointment. David? Uh, I was never very sanguine about the report uh, <laughs> producing anything but more of the same. Mm. Uh, again, the detail uh, where it says uh, until a new model is developed, whatever that model might be, that we will maintain the current existing formulae which disadvantages the most disadvantaged children and schools in Australia, then we have to say that the Gonski Review was actually developed on a false premise, um, on the premise that we need to maintain the existing arrangements that began very uh, slowly in 1973 with some direct uh, Commonwealth funding of disadvantaged Catholic schools to bring them up to the resource level of the minimum resource level acceptable in state schools. Uh, to the current situation where we have millions and millions of dollars, billions of dollars uh, of taxpayers' funds money uh, going to schools that really don't need it at all. Paul. But parents who do. Um, Look, I, I applaud the efforts of the, the review committee to, to come to grips with what is a really very slippery eel, although uh, uh, to a degree I agree with Leslie in, um, in saying that, uh, that we're not quite sure where to move and we're not quite sure how to do it and it was filled with lots of motherhood statements that, that in the end are going to have to find some place to take root. and. So whilst I applaud their efforts, and I, I applaud their efforts particularly because they tried to take the partisanship out of um, this whole debate and not pit government schools against non-government schools. They tried to unpick, 
unpick the current circumstance and focus on individuals, individuals who might need much more assistance than other individuals. If schools, as a consequence, benefit, then good luck to them. But the focus is now on the individual rather than the school. However, you know, you, you, you pretty quickly ask some fairly practical questions that, to which there's been no answer given at all. And you're led to the view that it, it, it's pretty fanciful, I think, to expect that there's going to be a greater slice of the pie allocated to education throughout the country. I mean, finding, <clears throat> finding five billion doesn't sound like much when you say it, but you know, when governments are going to have to try and trim their budgets at times when they're operating to a large extent in deficit anyway, uh, is asking a hell of a lot of them. So, uh, you know, we've already started to see the political duck shoving and backing and filling, which doesn't fill me with any confidence at all that uh, the recommendations are going to be implemented. Now, look, a lot of other stuff will emerge through discussion and questions. Uh, let me just leave it at that at the moment. One of the things that um, is said in the report, and I'm sure most people sense anyway, is that uh, Australian education standards, uh, Australian students have slipped across the board in the last 10 years um, at all levels of achievement, but notably at the top end. Um, one of the um, really important sort of new parts of, of, of the Gonski Review is this school resource standard, um, allocating a base funding rate for every single student um, and then additional loadings uh, are added on to that for disadvantage. Um, is, is this a sort of a, a bottom-up approach that may well help uh, oh. the disadvantaged end but is going to do nothing overall to lift the highest uh, levels of, of, of achievement in Australian students. I don't think that's an effective way of dealing with things at all, Sally. I believe that that's still is based this, on... Is a, that what he's advocating, though? Is that a correct yes, summary? Yes, yes, yeah. that, yeah, that was a good mm. summary. But that is still a deficit paradigm. It's still deciding that to access additional funding, you need to demonstrate disadvantage or poorer outcomes. When uh, Also, when you do that and your outcomes improve, then you don't get the money. So the money is not based on um, the need of the students, okay? It's based on something else, on another. So I think that that's still a Band-Aid approach uh, that I think that is wrong. I think it's based on this idea that you can throw money at a school only, too, and that it will ne necessarily improve. I think what in most cases improves schools is something to do with the ethos and the support of parents for what's going on in that school. And you need that broad spectrum of the demographic um, to really make a difference. And that's what's going to make a difference to the top end in particular. Yeah, I, I'd like to make two points there. The first one is that I would dispute uh, the statement that Australian education standards have been dropping over the last 10 years. They've just been terrible for decades? No, no. Uh, Australia, <laughs> Australia quite proudly should be very proud of the fact that we rank around um, equal, uh, in the seventh place, but equal uh, four, five and six, uh, or five, six and seven, uh, with a number of countries in the standardised international testing. But uh, what we have happening in Australia is we have what we call a long tail of underachievement, where the disparity between the top performing students and the lowest performing students is about three years in academic achievement in the same year level. So that would mean that a year, one, a year nine student who was performing very well may be performing three years above uh, her equivalent uh, year nine student who was performing in another school at a much lower level. And that causes the overall average to decrease. Uh, this is quite unique to Australia and we can map that disparity of achievement almost uh, entirely to uh, postcode, to SES, uh, so socioeconomic status of the families. So that's the first point, that it's not about achievement. The second point that I'd like to make too about that achievement is that it's 
only in the last round of PISA studies that that's actually occurred and there are many commentators who suggest that this may be an aberration as well so we need to wait for it's over 10 for a trend. years though isn't it that no, time? no it's only since uh, so the most recent round of PISA studies which was in 2000 and was it 9? I yeah, think, I think so. and, and uh, it, the change was from 2007. Now that, that's the first point. But the second point is about this funding following the child. Uh, really, it begs the, the question, and I call it the elephant in the room of the Gonski Review, and that is, where is it said that, um, sc that school choice has to equal private school funding? So that, fair enough, every child is entitled to have a certain amount of resource allocation for his or her education. But if the parent of that child chooses for one reason or another to not use the public facilities that are made available for that school education, then why should that funding follow that child uh, to another location? The, the issue can be compared to and I use the analogy of uh, tollways. We have tollways, private tollways in, a, in our city of Melbourne, and we also have public roads. Uh, if you choose to try, drive on the public road, uh, it might take it a little bit longer. Isn't this always the, the argument? Toll, but the tollway isn't, is... Isn't this what it is always reduced is your to choice. and what Gonski's trying to well, override? Well, Gonski has accepted has accepted the status quo, which only began in 1973 with the Carmel Report, uh, into a review of education that was meant to use Commonwealth funds to bring up to, to par the most disadvantaged Catholic parochial schools. Now that's been done a long time ago. And now we have a situation where we have capital grants being made to schools like Paul's former school of six million dollars per annum. Mm. Uh, now, now David, and you really need to get your facts correct. That is not correct. Melbourne Grammar got about three million out of the BER, the Building the Education Revolution, which I thought was a disgrace, frankly, if you want my view. That should not have gone to a school like Melbourne Grammar when there are government schools with uh, spouting falling off the wall, where lavatories don't work, where windows are broken, where walls in classrooms are, you know, have holes punched in them. I, I, I couldn't support that. But prior to the building the education revolution, and in my entire time at that school, which was, as Sally suggested, 14 years, not one cent of federal government money or state government money came for infrastructure projects. There was recurrent funding, I'll accept that, that amounted in total to about 10% of what it cost uh, to educate a child in that school for a year. But not one cent of infrastructure money came to the school. Now, you know, if we, if we get stuck in this um, time-honoured uh, but rather unproductive discussion about government versus non-government, we, we really won't go anywhere. Uh, I mean, I could, I could easily say to you, David, if you want to improve, uh, if, if every child came out of a fee-paying school and the parents said to the government, you educate my child, there's $5 billion across the nation extra that's going to be needed to, be, to provide just to maintain them at the current standard. So in fact, the existence of, of non-government schools saves federal and state governments across this nation around five billion dollars a year. That, now, now Paul, that, that, that is a furphy because... No, I, I'm not going to let okay. this descend into this argument okay. because this is exactly <laughs> what, uh, what I think Gonski is trying to override. And well, I I don't, think, but see, and I don't think he's overridden. I think he's just assumed that we're going to have more of the same. Okay, he's no, probably trying to tread delicately through it. We yes. certainly take your point that mm. the fatal flaw in it, in mm. your opinion, mm -hmm. is that it doesn't uh, it doesn't address... Promise any change. Sally, so, I promise to answer the question about resources. Um, my um, my belief is that there is a law of diminishing returns in terms of throwing resources at education. Uh, some of the really deprived schools need to be brought up to scratch, there's no doubt about that. But 
I don't think throwing money at resources is what will improve student outcomes. The one major disappointment I had with the Gonski Review, and we were chatting about this before the session, is the fact that it says nothing about the quality of teaching. And in the end, it's the quality of teaching that makes a difference to student outcomes. I, I would ask the audience here, when you think back to your school days, what do you remember? Do you remember the, the people and the staff who actually made a difference to you, to your approach to life, to what you might have learned, to what you did in, in life beyond school? Or was it the fact that you could sit on a padded seat in, a, in a, an assembly hall? Uh, I'd venture to say it was the former rather than la the latter. And the nub of the problem to me, or the nub of the issue is, let's direct all of our or much of our attention as possible to getting the right people into teaching because they're the ones who are likely to fire the imagination of students and to do what the, that great old educator Sir James Darling said once to light the inextinguishable flame in other words to fire a student so that that student rather like you Sally who didn't like school but had somehow the fire in the belly to love education and I reckon it's people who do that not buildings. Well, while I would agree with Paul on that issue, the Gonski Review was not about teacher education, uh, about teaching, and we've had so many inquiries into teachers and teacher education, and uh, we know what needs to be done, and we can't do it without the funds <coughs> and without the raising of other standards, for example, entry standards in, into our universities, into our teacher education faculties. But that was not the imprimatur. That was not the question that Gonski was asked to do. And Gonski uh, it, it doesn't, doesn't go down that road at all because he, he's not allowed to go down there. Leslie, can you, can you have a review of school funding and exclude teachers? Um, exclude a discussion of the quality of teachers? Well, and what they're paid? Um, Yes, because I think that the argument that goes between the federal and the state, the demarcation about overall funding, is where it's going to take up that argument about resourcing. I think it still comes down to the bottom line of resourcing, because I agree with Paul that the quality of teachers is incredibly important. Um, but the allocation of funding is a demonstration of what faith you put in those teachers, what value you place in the education process, what value you place in the students in that school. And it is always going to be inextricably caught up with it. The difficulty is also that you get the, the best teaching when you have um, aspirational kids, when you have that range of the demographic so that you don't have the, I guess, you know, sometimes the difficulty of only ever trying to bring kids up to the base level. Kids need the challenge of all ends of, the, of both ends of the spectrum. And I think that makes us a much better society if a school has that. I think it's that social harmony um, and empowerment that, in, that education should engender. And to a large extent, funding given by governments is a statement of their belief in the system. And that's, that, I think, has not happened with this mm. report. What, one of the commissioned um, papers <coughs> that was commissioned by the Gonski Review for uh, its uh, information was the NAUS report, N-O-U-S, NAUS report. And they said there are three things, uh, putting aside SES, socioeconomic status, uh, that are indicative of academic success for children. The first one is, of course, is the child's past performance, goes without saying. The second one is what the teachers do in the classroom, and that wasn't in the purview of the Gonski Review. But the third one, and this is where it talks about resources, that a school's success is in influenced by its standing in the community, its reputation, and its resources, which determine its market power. The most profound conclusion that this uh, paper said, we reach after extensive and intensive analysis is that there is a well understood set of ingredients that contribute to student performance and widen the opportunity for children of all backgrounds to achieve their, perform their potential. That is, Mark, the s s school resources are going to be an incredibly important pulling factor to maintain the social and cultural diversity in schools to countermand what we've seen since 1973 and more, moreover, more so in the last 15 years, a, 
an exodus from our government school system by those people who can afford to leave to independent schools, which has reduced the pool of potential uh, and aspirational uh, students in those schools so that we are often rem left with what we call a residualised pool of students who are not having the social and cultural support at home, the aspirational uh, means to achieve their potential. Mm -hmm. And this is, uh, in discussion with Leslie um, beforehand, this is something that Leslie School has fought against over the last 15 years and is now showing the results of, mm. of that in their changed results mm. uh, in the last couple of years in their VCE and VCAL results. If you gave me just you know, a smaller school with a huge amount of funding um, and students from a narrow demographic than the lower, more needy demographic, but you gave me you know, three times the amount of money to deal with them versus another school with a broad demographic and much less funding, I would take the latter every time because that's what our students need and I really believe that's what society needs. It's so the money's not throwing money at it is not uh, is is it's, it, a, it's part of the story but mm. as I said before it's a sign of the value mm. you place mm. in education. All right well it, it, talking let's talk about the politics of it then and, and about how um, education is valued. The, the response to the review from the government has been, well, we're going to have more discussion, more consultation. Mm. Mm. From the opposition, it's been uh, uh, incredibly just negative. Um, and and I, I haven't really seen any uh, deep analysis uh, at all. When you're dealing with that, and then you've, you're dealing with a report that is suggesting much greater cooperation between federal and state and territory uh, governments, is there? How do you override? You know, how do you how do you get cohesion? How do you get people to actually care about educating our kids as the as the mm. major priority? Mm. With enormous difficulty, when you've got an increasingly non-labour drift across the country, uh, you know, Queensland will fall uh, this weekend. So all the polls tell us. Uh, there are non-Labor governments, or there will be non-Labor governments in, in Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria and Western Australia. Uh, fi fighting? Yeah, probably fighting, in, certainly in political terms, a Labor government federally. So it'll be increasingly difficult for the Gillard government to actually convince the states that they're going to have to find 70% of that five billion extra dollars that need to be found each year. Um, I don't like the chances of there being any, you know, significant change to what we live with currently, quite frankly. Uh, I think Gonski was probably a good idea and it might be consigned to a pile of those things that are very good ideas about which people do nothing in the end. Sadly. I think we can tell that that's what's going to happen because it's talking about that five billion as being a potential, you know, an if sort of money. But also all the rest, as David said, is staying exactly the same. The postcard, postcode funding model, um, all of the rest, you know, the block grants for independent schools, you know, the guarantee that no school will lose a dollar. So there is going to be, and if this is what we're getting from a Labor government, we've got I no chance the, of I a Liberal government coming in. Will, will remain. They said it will continue until, until there, we have a new funding yeah, until model in 2014. Yeah. But, and, but they've and, said and until individual. at least 2014. Yeah. And again, the issue is yeah. will be a political one. Well, um, Julia who Gillard will be in government. through Peter Garrett and others won't tell us where the federal government is going to get the money. So they don't appear to have any great particularly in a, in a climate where they're saying they will produce a surplus to the national budget for 2012-2013. Uh, they're not telling anybody where they're going to get the 1.5 billion from. And in fact, I don't know that they can get it. And the whole of this thing rests on the ability to be able to garner $5 billion out of federal and state governments. There's also that appalling suggestion that uh, they'll do leadership in philanthropy, that they'll set up some, a program for that. Now, that's a cop-out, if ever I've heard one. I think that's just appalling. Does that, Paul, seem 
insane to you as a as a method or possible uh, to, to possible? raise money privately mm. to fund education? Well, it's a much less reliable way of doing it. Mm. I mean, there's no culture of it in Australia. We, we would wouldn't be say? suggesting that we should mm. do the same for the defence forces. Mm. No. Nobody likes it's, it's the, the baking, idea yeah. of it's paying the cake stall idea more taxes. I mean, look. You know, any any party that goes to an election saying, "Look, we're going to take a bit more out of your hip pocket than the other mob will," uh, is is crazy. But if you want to provide something and you think it's important enough, you have to be able to create a good enough case for people to say that is emphatically in the nation's best interests, and I'm prepared to make my proportional sacrifice to have that happen. Leslie, do your um, teachers? care about the Gonski report? Are they talking about it and arguing about it and uh, reading it? I've certainly raised it and spoken about it at council and at our um, consultative committee, which is, uh, I guess, a union type consultation. I think that it has really important political and industrial ramifications, and I think they need to understand that as political human beings. I see my role very much as one of maximising the resources coming into the school and then distributing them as effectively as I can for my students and staff. But uh, I think it's a political issue and that they ought to be involved in and cognisant of broad political educational issues. Because uh, you know, my passion for government education is what gets me up every morning and gets me to school ready to do the best job I can. And I assume that that's, that's what's theirs also. And they have been um, shocked by it. In terms of will it have an effect on their day-to-day -day work? Probably not. Um, because again, I'll just do as best I can with that money. Um, but, you know, down the track, there may be industrial ramifications, um, effects of this. If we want to, um, I'd be talking about the idea of what what programs you could fund, what sort of um, additional programs, either at the top end or the bottom end. I have the idea that uh, we shouldn't be, you know, it gets back to this deficit mentality. We shouldn't just be talking about, you know, more literacy and numeracy for kids. I want my students to have the very best art and music and um, cultural benefits, language laboratories, all of those sorts of things, those add-on benefits that we don't have. We, we do not have anything like a level playing field and that's what I want. Um, so there, will, there can no, be we'll, those We'll come to a effects, question time yes. a little later because we have to have microphones, it's being uh, audio cast. Sorry Sally. Sorry. Yeah, I just want to reflect on the lack of political will here. Uh, we recently had a visitor from Finland, Parsi Salberg, mm. who was the, uh, the generator, if you like, of much of the reform that's taken place in Finland to make Finland one of the most outstanding educational achieving countries in the OECD that we all compare our standards to. And what, what I learned from listening to him and also visiting Finland and working there late last year is that we actually have the most privatised education system in the world. And why on earth would we, would we leave to the marketplace to, the pri to private enterprise something that's so important as education. We wouldn't do the same for the defence or for foreign affairs. Uh, so uh, given that we ha have gone down this pathway for the last 39 years of increasing privatisation of our education system, we need to be able to stand up and say, we are very different to the rest of the world. Why is this the case? Even in countries like the United States, which is the home of neoliberal privatisation, their private school system there does not get one cent of government funding. In Finland, for example, well, Parsi Solberg laughs and he says, we, we just don't have private schools in our country. All children go to government schools. If there are some uniquely private schools, but they are fully funded by the government, you have a Montessori school and you have a, an Islamic school, but they are fully funded and they are run by the government as 
the, is the case in many other in, countries in, Finland, in the world. Too, though, uh, you need a master's degree to teach in a school. Absolutely. It's harder to get into primary education than it is into the medical school at mm -hmm. the University of Finland. Mm -hmm. I mean, their culture of teaching, of, of, of teaching as vocation, uh, is, is, is completely different. But it wasn't always so. Mm -hmm. in, in fact, interestingly, at the same time as we went down the pathway in 1973 of the privatisation of our education system, Finland did what they call an education settlement and they decided that they were going to, to base their education reform on equity. And since that time in 1973, they have done everything that they could to improve the, the equity between schools and among school students. Uh, and that meant improving and enhancing uh, the prestige of teachers, um, ensuring that every teacher in front of every child in every classroom in Finland has a master's degree, etc. Uh, and there is no argument in Finland between any of the political parties uh, about this issue. It is agreed upon and there is, there is no argy-bargy between regions and, and the centre. Uh, teachers are trusted, teachers are left to do their job and they don't have standardised testing like we have in grades three, five, seven and nine here, uh, and yet they have outstanding results. But it wasn't always so. Uh, 39 years ago, they went down a particular track, and 39 years ago, we went down another pathway. Well, it was longer than 39 years ago. I mean, there's been... That, that, that was the implementation of direct funding from government. Prior to that, there were tax concessions for people who paid money for education and that, that preceded 1973 by quite some way. I think 1966 uh, it started here. Uh, no, no, the tax concessions were in place well before then. In 1964, Robert Menzies enabled public funding to be used to construct science laboratories. And that's that's right. that, that really started the process of the, of um, direct government funding, the, the, I guess. The, the principle in Finland of equity and equality over choice and excellence, which is how uh, Parsi Solberg puts it, um, is a it, it, it is a phenomenal one for somebody like me to hear. This uh, <laughs> the the idea that excellence would be overridden um, is it does it make sense to you, Leslie, as a as a as a, a principle? From what I hear, the idea is that if you get the bulk of the people going, obviously with a, a system that has all the middle classes, has the aspirational parents choosing, I mean, well not choosing, going to that mm. school because it is providing such a wonderful education based on the, the equitable principles on which the program is devised. Of which he um, says they're very similar to the Gonski recommendations too. Mm. Mm. So mm. If, if that's happening, I, I think it obviously is that excellence uh, is part of the product. Mm. It's, um, you know, we, we would think now that we have a choice between an excellent school and a not so excellent school and a downright bad school perhaps. And parents are choosing. There's no, um, you know, we got rid of zoning, what, in the 70s or something. Mm -hmm. um, so parents do choose a school that they think is within, well, they choose according to their means and according to their aspirations for their children. Mm -hmm. So I think that the excellence is a product of that strong support mm -hmm. and that more balanced um, demographic. In, indeed, um, the Finns, Pathy Solberg, says this time and time again, that we never aimed for excellence, we achieved it, and we were sometimes quite surprised at that incredible achievement. But on reflection and on research, they find that the, achieve, the, the high achievement that is apparent and evident in Finland in all their schools is as a result of the lack of difference between the highest achievers and the lowest achievers. In other words, more of the students are achieving in the middle band than having the extremes. And I mentioned earlier about the three-year difference, the three-year gap between our highest achieving students in one year level and our lowest on these tests. In Finland, it's about nine and a half months, which means that overall, the difference between children in one school and another school is far less than we find in our country here. Mm -hmm. I, uh, can I intrude there for a moment? In the late 1970s, I worked in a school in the UK 
where um, the paradigm was totally different. I mean, here you make a lockstep um, gradual move upwards year by year. So um, the variable is how much you learn, not the amount of time you spend trying to learn. There, the variable was how much time you spent trying to learn, and the fixed article was how much you learned. In other words, at the end of every term, and the year was divided into four, you either made progress up the ladder or you needed to do some things again to consolidate what you'd learned. So you would find after a three-year period, you might have some 14-year-olds in the same class as some 17-year-olds. Academically, they were at the same level. The others didn't lose heart because they were stuck in a class where they had no idea of what, was, uh, what the teacher was on about or what the other students were doing. It was, it was I suppose, a, an attempt at mastery learning. Um, and, you know, whether, whether that sort of conflicts with Leslie's idea of having a broad range of abilities in the class and, you know, making sure you've got some high school. achievers that people aspire to or not, I, I'm not sure. But, but there were very few who came to that school and didn't want to learn. That, well, that's interesting because my understanding of all the research says that the idea of keeping students back till they've achieved mastery of year seven or year eight content is in fact detrimental mm. to their progress because it the element of motivation and, and aspiration is so mm. strong. I mean, you know, you're dealing with teenagers, they are quite complex people, um, complex uh, young people, and Unlike, you know, a car, if it's not sort of tuned right, then you can retune it and tune it again and it'll work. Students are not, young people are not widgets. We can't just do it again and hope that they will pick it up because it's really to do with that relationship that's going on between the teacher and the student and um, so many things impact on that. So I don't think that sounds like a system that would work well at mm -hmm. all. But are you trying to tell me, Leslie, that in your classes at your school, you have some students who don't know what's going on? Uh, no. Why would, I, why would you think... Where did you make that leap? Well, I don't understand. You're telling me that, uh, that a system on which you would promote students on the basis of what they'd mastered at a particular time, so there was no pressure on oh, them... Oh, OK. Um, um, it's not going to work. I would say that you would do a great balance of judgment. It's very rare that a student would be held back for academic reasons, but that doesn't mean that they are not coping at all. It me does mean it's a real challenge for teachers sometimes to differentiate. But un you do certainly offer within the school a great range of programs and uh, that were, are designed to get students where they are and take them further forward. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I want to pick up a couple of points that Paul's thrown out there. And can I just say yeah. that once um, David's done that, I'm going to open yeah. it up to, uh, for questions, so get ready. So mm. Paul, Paul has said that there will be children who don't want to learn. I've never seen a child that doesn't want to learn in, when they first come to school. Uh, ah. Okay. I wouldn't when they disagree first, with when that. They first come to school. What happens so, between the so, age of seven and so, the age so of the, fourteen? So my point is that we that we often in our schools do something to turn those children exactly. off, and some of those things we've talked about before, and the Gonski review has talked about those things uh, in in considerable detail, especially if you look at the at the commissioned reports that uh, the Gonski review asked to be done, but. Uh, as I said, uh, children, all children do want to learn. We have to then look at who are the children in our schools. And if we are able to cherry pick the very best, then of course we don't have problems of teaching those children in schools. But our government schools, which is uh, the, still the majority, barely hanging on, the majority of students still go to, go to government schools. It wasn't always so. There were the vast majority of, of children went to government schools. They have to take all, all children into their schools. They, they can't reject anybody. Uh, and therefore, uh, people like Leslie and her teachers 
have to take all comers and as she said it's difficult sometimes to differentiate the learning to meet the needs of every individual student in particular if the class sizes continue to increase if the teachers have uh, more increased workloads if the resources are pulled out of the schools of um, literacy and numeracy coaches as we are seeing time and time again uh, one of the things that struck me when I was in Finland walking around their schools is when I saw a child who didn't quite understand something they didn't get lost in the school as you said they, um, they don't what they don't know what's going on if they didn't know what's going on there was a remediation teacher immediately available to pick them up to correct any mistakes they might have to improve the situation and they would immediately go back into the classroom as if they'd just gone out for a toilet break for 15 or 20 minutes it, it wasn't up to the uh, teacher in the classroom is dealing with class sizes of the same nature that we have here between 25 and 30 children uh, who are just normal kids just like the ones we have in our country here uh, this support was readily available it's fully funded by the taxpayer uh, and a decision has to be made about equity and we don't have that equitable uh, funding in our school system here. Uh, there's often been a discussion about class sizes not making a lot of difference. If class sizes don't make a lot of difference, why is it that the most expensive independent schools herald small class sizes as one of their benchmarks to attract the market power of their of, of their families so if if classes don't small classes don't make a difference to education attainment then why are independent schools uh, going down that track well parents believe it for a start they do believe small classes make a difference um, I, I, th the one area where I think it does make a difference is to teacher uh, stress uh, you know a teacher taking a class of 20 year 10 kids is a different animal from one who takes a year 10 class of 30 kids I don't have any doubt about that mm. uh, but in terms of academic achievement I don't think there's any research at all that shows you that there is a difference in attainment levels. Is that right? That's between, remarkable. Yeah, it is. No, between it, it, well, it's, it's between, between about 45 in and fact, 15. It, it, mm. In fact, there is a lot of research, but the research shows uh, that there is a diminishing return yeah. uh, once you pass the class size of around 20. And so it's, between, it's 20, between 20 it's, and 30, it's what has it's maximum returns. effect. It's, so it's done in a relative. So all between right 15 way. and 20, there's a huge I difference. I am going to open uh, up. Uh, there's some people walking around with microphones. Um, this gentleman here, and then we'll go to you. Uh, I put it to the panel that um, we should all be advocates, advocates for ending uh, the present funding model for private schools and uh, should only fund fee-free schools in a fully integrated system. And I put, put this to you, um, three points. One, we should be advocates of that because a higher concentration of disadvantaged students in, are in disadvantaged schools in Australia than other OECD countries. Um, two, Kongsky carried out research and found that there was no value-added difference between a private and a public-funded school. And uh, the third point is with the heavy investment over the past 10 years, it's encouraged the growth um, of the private school system, but there's been no improvement internationally compared to, f to school uh, nations that do not fund the private school system. So why would any country advocate the continuing system that we have at the moment? I can, I can give you a very short answer, political expediency. Mm. Paul, would you disagree? And, and financial mm. expediency. Mm. Uh, you know, if the, the, there's less of a drain on the public purse if there are private schools. Um, and I wouldn't run away with the idea that every child in a, in a non-government school gets funding at the level that students in government schools do. They don't. It ranges anywhere between 70% of what the published cost of educating a child in a, in a government school is down to about 
of what it costs to educate a child in a government school. So, you know, a school like Melbourne Grammar would get about $2,000 per student from the public purse, whereas maybe a parochial school uh, in one of the northern suburbs of Melbourne might get, might get close to seven or $8,000 from the public purse. There's an enormous range dependent on uh, that criterion that uh, David and, and Sally have referred to before, the socioeconomic status model, which looks at, I mean, it's a virtually unfathomable um, statistic to try and calculate, but it tries to draw out um, the, the educational status of the family, where they live, and so on. Um, what strikes me about the Gonski Review is, and a hell of a lot of money has been ploughed into it, with what few figures we've seen that have tried to put some element of substance on what the recommendations are, there's actually not going to be much difference to the way the funding operates now. And, you know, if you were really wanting to turn the system on its ear, you would have to completely unravel it and put it together in a totally different way. The issue about, about, about uh, private schools, independent schools, actually saving us money is a real furphy. Given the amount of money that's gone out of the Commonwealth and state coffers, our taxpayers' funds, to fund middle-class welfare or upper-class welfare over the years since 1973, uh, all that money could have paid for in enormous improvement in the resource standing and the provision of excellence and equity in all our schools. Can Provided those two? students then didn't have to be educated by the state. Now, well, can I add too that there is a, a figure that we've never seen and as far as I know has never been discussed, which is the amount by which the tax pool is diminished because of tax deductions um, available to uh, independent <coughs> schools, sponsorships, buildings, companies who get involved in those ways. So I think that that's also in that way the tax pool is missing out mm. because you know my, while my parents might claim, I don't know, 10,000 all up, I'm talking about across the school in tax deductions, I suspect that there'd be six figures added to that in a school of like Paul's. Um, you know, that's a Paul. lot of money. It, that former school yeah. falls. Yeah. I just think that's a lot of money well, look, that's in not in the tax pool. We need a strong educational system. Absolutely. Uh, whether it's government or, or non-government. And I don't reckon it's productive at all to, to try to set one sector, if you like to call it that, against the other. We've, we've somehow got to come up with a, a schema that, that makes the whole of our educational system strong. It may be by what David suggests, i.e. remove all funding from private schools and let them sink or swim. Uh, <clears throat> some parents won't let them sink. They will, con they will make up the deficit if government funding is, is withdrawn. Others will have to close because they get a very significant amount of money from um, the public purse. So be it. Let them go back to a government system that might well have more money to distribute to improve um, the standards, the culture, the, the look of the buildings that, uh, that these other students will have to go to. I, I'm not sure of the answer in all of this, I'd have to say. I mean, you can be ideological about it, but in the end it comes down to how much money is the Australian taxpayer prepared to pay, and then how much is the federal government prepared to slice out of its annual take from the tax uh, that it collects to attribute to education. To me, there is no more important process in the community than education. Maybe health and housing are very important as well, but education is the future of our nation. And if we're not prepared mm -hmm. to make some tough decisions and maybe take some money from other areas of the national budget that seem to me to waste a phenomenal amount, then we won't make much progress in this whole debate. But the, the, the question was not about that, about redistribution of the pie from, from defence to education, but about rationalisation of the spending, of the total spend, Commonwealth and state, on education. And a choice has to be made uh, somewhere along the line and sooner rather than later, are we going to continue to fund on the basis of so-called choice uh, where we are asking people who are 
paying taxation on a $45 or $50,000 uh, annual income to fund the choice of those who are earning $100,000 plus a year. Well, David, they're all funding the government system as well, so it's a much more complicated argument than you're trying to make it. Thank you. Uh, just a short comment, if I may, about Finland, where I go a lot and know a lot about for many, many years. It's very interesting to see the outcomes of what you're describing. I, I move with politicians, diplomats, artists, and when these people meet, you know, uh, they all have gone to the same schools. And it seems to be uh, the social equaliser amongst them, you know, mm. to talk about their society. By the way, also, university education is also free, you know. Mm. But coming back to where we are at, and I don't think there's any political hope of, of having an integrated system where we'll have no fees um, and that education is free, and, and I wish it were so. But the question really is now, uh, in order for so-called independent and private schools to continue to receive money at all, you know, from taxpayers and the government. And what do you think about this proposition that they should therefore not set their access to or entry level in any way? They should, if someone knocks on the door and says, I want to come to your school instead of my, if I have indeed a local government school, I want to go to your school and I, I pay the fees, they can't refuse a student from entering that school. Well, in most schools that is the case, frankly. I mean, there, there are one or two that set entrance exams. Melbourne Grammar did. It had an examination that really, I suppose, because it's a reasonably high-powered school academically, and you know that because of the results they get in senior academic examinations, um, you wanted to make sure that a child who came to the school would actually be able to cope with what teaching was presented to it. So it, it was really diagnostic rather than, rather than discriminatory in saying, I don't like the look of you, you're not a genius, you're not coming, but you are. And the majority of, of uh, independent schools fundamentally have an open door policy. Many of them can't take students because they're full. Their classes are full and they've determined they can't take any more students. But uh, you know, it's not... It's not right to say that, that uh, independent schools stand there with a sort of haughty hand up like that saying, you're not coming to my place, I don't like the cut of your jib. No, of well, course, uh, of course. so long as you can pay the fee, of mm. course. you can get in. Well, of course you've got to pay a fee. It, that's, so not that, that's, that's so of course, that not discriminatory. What discriminatory. drive? I mean, you pay for your car. An if you want a, a, a 1990 Commodore. But, Good. But that well, is discriminatory. No, well. And if you're thinking of um, any sort of system where, you know, uh, you know, I wouldn't hate to portray you as a haughty type, Paul, but in most independent schools, there are not there's not a huge demand for, uh, um, sorry, uh, there's not an open door policy for people with significant disadvantage, with significant disability. Are you sure um, of that? All of it. Well, the Gonski figures make it very clear. Um, well, in terms you, of, yes, well, they you, do. 15% of disadvantaged children, thereby designated either Indigenous, um, low socioeconomic sta status, uh, rural and remote, are enrolled currently in independent and non-government schools. And what if, about those you, with learning disabilities? And if you take out the um, Catholic system from that, then the figure yes. is even greatly reduced. I think that's it's 8% right. or something yes. like that. Um, you know, that, that's not an open door policy. That's not anything like it. So the gentleman there and somebody who's closest to the mic. Yeah. And then this gentleman um, next. <clears throat> Isn't the political reality in this debate that um, independent schools have a veto over the outcome of reform and um, the, for that reason the government's very wary about going down the path because it's very easy for the Herald Sun to come out with class warfare headlines and they obviously don't want to go back down the uh, Mark Latham <laughs> path. So the reality is I think that it's going to depend on the independent schools wanting reform and thinking that reform is better than the existing system with all its anomalies and what's it going to take to get to that point and what's it going to take within the independent sector for the majority of schools to say here's a system which is more equitable and gives us a better deal 
and that the schools which at the moment are getting an unfair benefit, and it's not just the richest school, but there's just a lot of anomalies in the way the money is divided, um, for the independent sector to say this is a fairer and better system. It, it would be interesting to, to hear responses from the current school councils or um, boards of schools like Geelong Grammar and Melbourne Grammar. Uh, each of them have a budget surplus of around $110 million. What? $110 million. I it. Yeah, that's, that's the statistics that are on their school yeah. website. See, look, this uh, is so really where an enormous number of furfies emanate. Well, As a surplus of $110 million. Yes, they wouldn't even you. take in $110 million a well, year, David. Don't talk nonsense. This is a, a crude surplus reported. It's uh, crude, all right. No, we're not going to have anything okay. crude here. No. Okay. A, a crude, a crude. Look, look <laughs> you crude. heard <laughs> so crude. the questioner asked about, you know, when are we going to take a more global philosophical view of what is necessary to have an improved education system? You heard Leslie say before, one of her major tasks is to maximise what resources come into her school. Now, why can she be able to do that? and independent schools can't adopt the same attitude. They're trying to maximise the resources that come into their school. So, in the, I'm sorry, in the, no, in the, end, in the end, it will come down to what a government thinks it can get away with or what it convince the, can convince the electorate to, to swallow. And, you know, it, it is a, a fairly supportable statistic that nearly 45% of students in years 11 and 12 go to non-government schools. So as David suggested before, there's a decreasing majority as you, as you go up through the schools that attend government institutions. Um, that may, that's an, an enormous pulling power in, in uh, the electorate. Now, is a government going to stick by its principles or is it going to adopt a pragmatic approach of we can't afford to do this so we'll kowtow to uh, where we believe the votes are. Can, that's, I, that's can, where I, can I read from the financial no, statements of the schools? No, because we've got two okay. minutes left right. and uh, I don't want to okay. go into that kind okay. of facts mm -hmm. and figures. And mm -hmm. I'll say I'm interested as somebody that doesn't work in the education system at the, you know, Gonski tried to override as much as I think he, he felt he could, this public private rift. You know, there seems to be something very Australian about it and very deep um, and rather hostile. Uh, and I, I don't, I, I mean, I just wonder whether um, whether anything can kind of change in the, you know, in, in these models when it, it, it runs so deep. No one wants to give up the privileges that they've already have. I mean, and I think that normal. the system is it's getting worse. I guess that um, the rift, if you like, um, is getting worse because the the politicians who are making the rules now are probably products of the same independent system. Um, just a quick one. Yes, I said I wanted to be able to maximise the resources of my school, and you know, in, in odd cynical moment, I've thought I'll oh, double the fees and that. Way people will think it's a much better education, but I can't do that. That is not, um, you know, I I want to have a social justice principle that says to anybody's child, I'm very grateful to have your child. I will do whatever we can. Um, it doesn't matter if you haven't got a job. It doesn't matter if you've just newly arrived in the country. I will give you a fantastic education, and that's what I aim to do. So I would not and could not ever maximise my resources by raising fees to a ridiculous level. And besides that, I wouldn't be allowed to do it, but it's not just, it's not equitable, it's not fair, and that's what I want to be. And the parents wouldn't have to pay because they have an option. Yeah, exactly. They have an option to pay. Yeah, that's We've right. got time for one that's really true. quick question if it's really, really fast. I'll speak. <clears throat> I'll speak as quickly as I can. I'm a volunteer tutor in a homework club in the western suburbs and most of our students come from refugee backgrounds where they've lived in... It's not in Gilmore Girls College, is it? We had volunteer tutors in my homework club. <coughs> it is? I'm not saying. <laughs> um, most of our students have a refugee background. They've lived for years in war zones or refugee camps. They're miles behind in vocabulary, numeracy and general knowledge. They haven't lived in the proper community. They are lost in the classroom. 
What does the Gonski report hold out for them? Any hope at all, particularly those who can't even come to the homework club? Well, the, the Gonski report has said that it will offer an additional 15% of the current funding, and of that additional 15%, 75% will go to government schools um, who already have 80% of the disadvantage, um, etc. So I don't think the Gonski report holds out much. It says the right things, but uh, it, it makes those motherhood statements I talked about before. But I don't think that there's a lot of hope in it, no. It would be wonderful if the uh, local independent school would open up their doors to these children. Do you know what's happening, David? Do you know the relationships now there are between some non-government schools and some government schools? I mean, look, I feel as though I'm under threat here and under siege. I've been attacked from both sides. <laughs> and I'm not an apologist for the non-government system by any stretch of the imagination. I, I thought we were here to actually talk about what Gonski was proposing, not for me to try and sort of fend off uh, you know, being ambushed. Um, yeah, I think that's actually, you know, I think Paul does have some uh, right to, to, to mm -hmm. say that actually, but, but it also comes back to that difficulty. How do you overcome it? How do you get over it? Look, it is solely money. Mm -hmm. It is solely down mm -hmm. to money. And if we as a nation are not prepared to invest more money in education, we won't really make much difference, quite mm -hmm. frankly. Either invest more or reallocate what we currently invest. <laughs> all right, we have to uh, leave it there, but um, I want to thank you again all for coming. I wish we had more time. We don't. Uh, Leslie Lamb, David Zinger, and Paul Sheehan, uh, thank you very much. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.